Hello and welcome back to another video of Total Organic Chemistry. This time we will be taking a look at reduction and oxidation reactions in organic chemistry, as well as studying the hydride reductions of carbonyl compounds. So by the end of this video, the questions that you should be able to answer, as always, are what do reduction and oxidation mean in the context of organic chemistry? What compounds act as reducing agents that we can use in the laboratory? And finally, how can I synthesize alcohols from carbonyl compounds? I will be talking a little bit about nucleophiles and electrophiles in this video, so if those are new terms to you or if you'd like a review on those concepts, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel and take a look at those videos I've uploaded about that. So many of you might have heard of the terms of oxidation and reduction, or redox reactions, in the context of general chemistry, talking about the transfer of electrons between ions, something like that, maybe metals reducing and oxidizing each other, but it has a slightly different meaning in organic chemistry. And we'll start with oxidation here. So oxidation in the context of organic chemistry is either adding oxygen or maybe another electronegative element like a halogen to a compound, or also removing hydrogen from a compound will also be an oxidation. Reduction, on the other hand, is basically just the opposite. So removing oxygen or removing a halogen or something from a compound, or also adding H. So adding hydrogen is also considered a reduction. And as we move forward in organic chemistry, we will be encountering these terms very often and also learning what kinds of reagents, what kinds of reactions undergo oxidations or reductions. For this video, let's take a look at this reaction here. So we can start with acetone. This is our very simple ketone here. It's got a carbonyl group, so a double bond between carbon and oxygen. And we could reduce it, so let's draw this single-headed arrow here, to the alcohol. So to isopropyl alcohol, we have now this OH group, and we've added a hydrogen to this carbon here as well. I'll draw that in explicitly. And this will be a reduction, like I said. So we're basically we're adding H2 across this bond. So we have this hydrogen down here, as well as the hydrogen on the oxygen. So we are adding a net of H2 across that bond. The reverse of that could also happen. That's our oxidation. So bringing this alcohol back to the carbonyl compound would be subtracting or removing a net molecule of H2. So getting rid of this H down here and the hydroxyl H to give us this double bond. That would be removing, like I said, H2, and that would be our oxidation. For this video in particular, we'll be taking a closer look at the reduction process. Okay, so how are we going to go about reducing this carbonyl? Well, let's take a look at the structure of acetone, so of this carbonyl compound. We know that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so that's going to have some sort of dipole, right? So we'll have the oxygen be a little bit negative, it'll have a partial negative charge, and the carbon bonded to it will have a partial positive charge. In addition to that inductive effect of dipoles, we also have a resonance structure that we can draw here. So if we take this electron pair in the double bond and swing it up to the oxygen, we can draw a resonance structure where oxygen has a full negative charge and carbon has a full positive charge. And although this is a minor resonance contributor, it does still contribute to the structure. So we can use this to determine the reactivity of a carbonyl compound. So because we have this positive charge on carbon, in this resonance structure, that means that this carbon is electrophilic. So carbonyls have this electrophilic carbon that is susceptible to nucleophilic attack. And we will learn that you can have many different nucleophiles attack this carbon, but for this video we're going to be taking a look at this hydride nucleophile. So this will be sort of our H- nucleophile. I'll put that in quotation marks because we know that H- is not a stable ion that you can isolate but we have lots of compounds that can act like an H-. So two of those compounds that are very common in organic synthesis are sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. So I can draw the structures of both of those there. 
The boral hydride anion and the aluminum hydride anion are the important things that we want to take a look at. So the sodium and lithium are just counter ions. The boral hydride is this boron center with four hydrogens. So we know that boron is going to have that formal negative charge because it has four bonds instead of its preferred three. And we also know that since hydrogen is more electronegative than boron, then it's going to carry the partial negative charge in this compound. We're normally used to seeing hydrogen with the partial positive charge because most of the elements that we work with in organic chemistry, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all the halogens are going to be more electronegative than hydrogen. But with these semi-metals or metals such as boron or aluminum, they are actually less electronegative than hydrogen, giving us a sort of H- type nucleophile. And the structure is very, very similar with aluminum hydride. All we have is an aluminum center now, and aluminum is actually even less electronegative than boron. So we'll see the changes that that makes in reactivity, but for now, they act as the same sort of H- donor. Let's look at a reaction that uses one of these compounds here. So we can take our carbonyl again, acetone, and react it with sodium borohydride. And this reaction is usually done in an alcohol solvent like methanol or sometimes ethanol. And what we get from this is the alcohol. So we get a reduction reaction where this carbon-oxygen double bond has changed to a single bond, and we've added a molecule of H2 across this bond. Okay, so let's look at the mechanism now. We start with our molecule of acetone, and then we can draw in our borohydride anion next to it here. And what will happen is because this BH bond is so polar, and hydrogen is going to have that partial negative charge, we can draw this bond swinging over to attack the partially positive carbon in the carbonyl compound. And at the same time, one pair of electrons in the carbon-oxygen double bond will go on to attack the hydrogen from the methanol molecule. So this is one concerted step, just like we had in the SN2 mechanism from before. This is two movements of electrons happening at once. So now we end up with two hydrogen atoms added to our carbon-oxygen double bond. So we have one hydrogen down here, Now we'll draw that in red, and the other hydrogen bonded to the oxygen, and I will draw that in blue. And you notice how I've color-coded these. So we have the red hydrogen from the borohydride, and that hydrogen will always come from whatever the reducing agent is, whereas the hydrogen on the oxygen comes from our solvent, so from the methanol solvent or other alcohol that you use and that will be the hydrogen that is always bonded to the oxygen in our final alcohol product. And you can note that because our borohydride anion has four hydrogens, it can theoretically reduce four molecules of carbonyl to oxygen from just one molecule of borohydride. However, this isn't really how it works in the laboratory, and usually you have to use a stoichiometric amount of reducing agent. So you have to normally use closer to a one-to-one -one ratio just because of other effects that happen. Chemistry is usually pretty imperfect in that regard. Our other reducing agent that we can use is lithium aluminum hydride, like I talked about. And because aluminum is less electronegative than boron, like I talked about earlier, it will be much more reactive than the borohydride reducing agent. In fact, it is so reactive that we can't use any protic solvents during our reductions with lithium aluminum hydride. So whereas with borohydride we can use uh, methanol or ethanol as a solvent, we actually have to use something called diethyl ether or any other aprotic solvent when we're working with lithium aluminum hydride. So our reaction for lithium aluminum hydride will look a little bit different. Let's draw it out here. We again start with our carbonyl compound, and we're going to react it with lithium aluminum hydride in diethyl ether. And a lot of times you'll see this written as ET2O, so 
two ethyl groups attached to one central oxygen, like this. So this is our aprotic solvent. And we'll actually write this with a 1 in front of it, because this will be our first step of the reaction. And then afterwards, so we can write 2, and we'll just do an aqueous workup, so we can just write H2O for our second step. And the reason we need that second step is that, unlike the reaction with borohydride, we don't have any normal proton source, like we did with the methanol, to bond to that oxygen. So we're going to need to do a separate step to add that extra hydrogen to the alcohol in the end. However, in the end, this will give us the exact same product. So we'll end up with the alcohol here, where the carbonyl has been reduced to a CO single bond. And we can draw the mechanism out for this. It'll be very similar to the previous mechanism. First, we will have our carbonyl here again, and our aluminum hydride anion with our minus charge on the aluminum. And then we'll take the aluminum hydrogen bond, swing it up to the carbon on the carbonyl. And then those two electrons in the CO double bond will just swing up and hang out on the oxygen. Because again, we don't have any protic solvent this time. So there's nowhere for those electrons to go. So that'll give us this compound here with the hydrogen, the red hydrogen, added to the carbon, and then we have an O minus. So after that in the laboratory, then you would add water to quench the reaction, so that'll get rid of any additional unreacted lithium aluminum hydride, and it will also add a proton to the O minus here. So we will end up with this compound, where we have again the red hydrogen on the carbon, and then we'll have this blue hydrogen bonded to the oxygen on the alcohol, exactly the same as the borohydride reduction. And just like the borohydride reduction, theoretically, lithium aluminum hydride could react with four equivalents of carbonyl, because it has four hydrogens. However, again, just like the last one, this is not a perfect reaction, and usually you'll have to use a equivalent amount of a reducing agent. One final thing that is pretty important to note is that this mechanism that I've drawn is a little bit simplified. So this reaction with aluminum hydride actually proceeds through sort of this intermediate here, where we have an aluminum center, and we're actually, instead of the hydrogens, we're actually going to have four bonds to the OR group from our alcohol intermediate. So after that first reduction step, we end up with this aluminum intermediate, and it's actually this intermediate that gets decomposed by the water in the second aqueous quenching step. So although that's not super important to draw out in the mechanism, if you're going to be doing this uh, in a class or on an exam or something like that, it is something to take a note of. So that is one way to synthesize alcohols from carbonyl compounds using some organometallic reducing agents. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you learned something, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel, as always, and like this video. If you are able, please consider donating to my Patreon page, I will link that below in the description. And that really helps me to continue creating these videos for you, and providing more content.